All right. Good afternoon, everybody. How we doing? Hey, Matt. Um, okay. Uh, today we've got to do a little bit of uh, housekeeping to start off. Next week, as you know from the emails that have gone out, uh, colloquium is going to be not in here. It's actually going to be piling onto buses and going over to Helping Hands for another service project. Um, I'll refer you to the emails for the details about that, but Lana is going to be handing out waiver forms. Basically, it just says that if you stub your toe on the trip, you don't get to sue us for, for pain and suffering or something like that. I don't know. Um, so, take one of these. This is how we're going to do attendance this week. Um, so, Lana, how do you want them to do it? Do you want them to pass them to the end, or do you want them to just leave it on their way out? Yeah, so on your way out, um, leave the waiver form on the back tables, right? So on your way out, leave the waiver form on the back tables, all completed and signed, and we'll be good to go, okay? Um, being handed up now. Uh, again, I'll say it one last time, leave it on the back tables on your way out. Um, and Lana will collect them there after colloquium. Um, today we have the last in what has been a six-part series, or will be a six-part series by the end of the day, um, in our partnership with the Office of Student Research. Uh, so Dr. Hazia is back. Uh, she's going to be talking about something that may feel far off for some people, um, she's going to be talking about graduate schools and thinking about going to graduate school. Um, personally, I don't think it's ever too soon to start thinking about what graduate school future um, might look like for you. Um, especially, I'll make a plug for something that, that I'm sort of involved with in kind of a tangential way, especially if you're in the humanities. If, the, if you're in the humanities, there's a program called the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship Program. Um, if you sort of develop some kind of a research plan um, in the midst of your sophomore year, you can apply for this undergraduate fellowship. It gives you a stipend for uh, the summertime for working on your research project. Uh, it gives you $10,000 to pay off student loan debt when you graduate and um, it gives you a stipend while you're in a PhD program, right? So it, it's a whole lot of money for doing ideally something that you love. Um, there's also a program like that in the sciences called the MARC program um, that are geared towards trying to get students to think about going to graduate school. So uh, have that tucked in the back of your mind as you listen to Dr. Hazia. Um, and I guess that's it for me. So I'll, I'll pass it over. All right, happy Friday. Good to see you guys. Um, it's almost been one whole year now, so this is the last time I'll be visiting you um, this year um, to talk about graduate school. Before um, I get started with that, though, I just wanted to also make my own series of announcements. Um, just uh, feel, remember, OSR is here to support you as you kind of continue on here at CSUSB. Uh, so make sure to check out our website, and I know it's been a long time since I talked to you about all of our events and programs, uh, but I am hoping I'll be able to come back and do that next year. So if you're ever looking for um, programs to support engagement in research or other creative activities or support your travel, uh, you know, remember we're here for that. Um, also, I'm trying to increase our social media uh, following. So if you could follow us on Instagram at OSR underscore CSUSB. 
Um, we will be, we've been posting there, but um, hopefully we will continue to do that more frequently. And then my last announcement was just that coming up week after next is research week on campus. So there's a number of different events, some for students, some for faculty, some for everybody. Um, but the most, uh, the kind of uh, most exciting event is Meeting of the Minds, which is the annual um, undergraduate and graduate research symposium. So that's where you will see um, creative uh, exhibits, poster presentations, and oral presentations. If you think back about those couple topics that I talked about, um, not, I think that was the last time I was here, or the time before. Um, if you want to get some examples, that's a great time to, to kind of go and watch um, your fellow peers, as well as to network with students, see how they got involved with research, and um, you know, it's an event that's also well attended uh, by faculty as well. So that is on Thursday, May 16th. It's pretty much all day. Um, the poster presentations are in the earlier part of the day. I want to say they start around 10. Um, but if you attend the poster presentation, there's a lunch afterwards, and you can go and get some free food. Um, uh, you can hear a, another research talk that's going to be um, completed by our outstanding graduate um, student. And then, speaking of Mel and Mays, on Wednesday, May 15th, uh, Mel and Mays um, uh, is uh, kind of bringing out a speaker. Um, Tyler Perry, the title of his talk is From Bloodhounds to German Shepherds, The Racist History of Interspecies Policy in American History. And so that's from 2 to 4. Um, so it'll be the talk, and then there'll be like a reception afterwards. Um, again, it's put on by the Mel and Mays uh, Fellowship, so the coordinator of that program and some of the mentors will be there if you want to learn more about it. Um, and as well, it's also just a nice opportunity to get um, a speaker on campus. And uh, the meaning of the minds um, part is overwhelmingly uh, kind of um, populated by students in social behavioral sciences and CNS. So it's nice to have uh, you know, a speaker coming in from the humanities that can kind of um, you know, bring in that, that uh, discipline and perspective. So those are two events, Wednesday and Thursday. Information's on our website. It's also on uh, social media, like Facebook, Instagram, and um, Twitter. So please check it out. OK. So I don't have as much um, content today because <laughs> Usually when I do this presentation, I talk about things like statement of purpose and CV, but you guys are already set to go on that. I'm sure you guys have all drafted something at this point or started to. Um, but, so this is a little bit uh, shorter. But um, So I'm hoping that I can give you a, a good amount of information so that you can start thinking about graduate school if you haven't already. Um, as well as get a sense of maybe what you might need to accomplish in order to be successful in that process. Um, and I hope to be able to do that without um, scaring anybody or um, you know, creating um, nocturnal panic episodes or anything like that. Um, you will be ready when the time is ready, but I mean when the time comes, but um, it's definitely good to have more information um, because as you'll see, there's a lot of different components that go in to um, finding a program, assessing the right programs for you, identifying a mentor if it's a mentor-based program, putting together your application. And so the more that you're aware of um, ahead of time, the better. Um, I knew, for example, like I wanted to go to graduate school, but um, didn't really know like what the process involved until it was actually time to apply. Uh, and that made it hard to do things like get involved in research, uh, meet faculty, get letters of recommendation. You know, um, so the more you know now, uh, the, be the better you'll be uh, when you actually apply. So this is a little bit of a joke, but it's kind of true, and I think it's funny. But you guys may, <laughs> but I, I do recommend graduate school as a way to avoid the real world for two to five additional years. So most people think like, why would I want to go to graduate school? Like, I'm done with school. I went to college. Like, I'm done. Really, I know there are great things that await you following graduation, but I promise you that 
there's some parts of adulting that aren't, aren't quite as fun, and you kind of get to prolong doing things that you love, like studying what you're interested in, what you're passionate about, you know, having time for social activities, getting to move and explore new places, and some of that stuff gets harder and harder uh, as you go on, or you know, kind of once you're in the workforce. So I, this is kind of meant to be a joke, but there is some truth in it that um, I think you know, it's kind of a blessing and a curse, because sometimes you talk to graduate schools, like, they'll, graduate students, they'll say, like, all oh, my friends have jobs, and I'm just poor, but there's some kind of freedom that comes with that, because you don't have necessarily the same kinds of responsibilities um, that people out in the real world do, so it is a nice way to kind of avoid that if that's something that, you know, you're trying to do. Okay. So types of graduate programs. The first kind of step is to, when you're considering graduate schools, to think about, um, I think, what your end goal is. <laughs> that, of course, is a, is, a, is a very big question, and that alone can induce a lot of anxiety. Um, but it's an important one, because depending on where you see yourself going career-wise, um, that's all going to have implications for what kind of program you may be interested in applying for. For example, not a, I mean, I think a lot of times, you know, um, you know, uh, having a PhD gets associated with, you know, um, a lot of prestige, and um, you know, uh, a lot of people might think like, oh, I love school, I love learning, I definitely want a PhD, and that's true for some people, but you know, it really depends on what you actually want to do down the road. Not everybody has to get a, a PhD, and that's not necessarily a, a good fit for everybody. Um, that being said, a, a master's degree isn't necessarily a good fit for everybody either. So you want to kind of think about what your end goal um, is and which degree um, is going to be um, most um, conducive to supporting that goal. Many times, um, students will pursue both degree programs, sometimes as a way to um, have more time to get themselves ready to apply to doctoral programs, say you don't have a lot of, you know, research experience, or um, your maybe your GPA wasn't as good in your undergraduate career, maybe you're just not sure exactly what you want to do. Masters is kind of a good um, step in that direction, um, but you know, it really kind of depends on your goals and then the discipline that you're in and what kind of work setting you want to end up ultimately working in, but. Master's programs typically are about two years. Um, there can be some variations. Sometimes there's like year and a half ones and three year ones, but most master's programs are two years. And they call them terminal master's programs, meaning that um, you know, your enrollment in them ends with you obtaining a master's degree, and then that's it, basically. Then there are doctoral level programs, and those are typically five years. So, and there can be a lot of variation within that, depending on the field, depending on the individual, depending on uh, what you study. Um, so, you know, if it takes you four years to conduct your research, that's going to be kind of difficult to get out, uh, you know, within four or five years, you know. But generally, on average, it's about five years. I think the, the typical range is like four to seven years. And again, it varies depending on the person, the area of research, and then just the program. Um, so usually, with most doctoral level programs, there are some that may um, have you apply um, after you have a master's degree. But that's, pretty, that's much less common. So most doctoral programs, you get a master's degree while you're en route. Um, to your PhD. So that's a difference. Uh, that's between terminal masters and kind of PhD programs is that doctoral programs you do get a master's but you you don't stop there. You basically um, keep going. Of course if you get a master's and then decide to go to a PhD program um, sometimes they'll count some of that coursework, sometimes they'll count the thesis project that you did. It kind of just depends on the program and you know how closely aligned your master's degree you know, um, the, the, the discipline, and obviously if it's the same discipline and similar uh, topic area, it'll be more likely to count um, courses and thesis. Um, any questions so far? So, 
I think I've emphasized, I'm sorry, this slide has a lot of text, but I think I've emphasized a lot, uh, at least when we were talking about CV and statement of purpose, that one of the things graduate programs are trying to determine when reviewing applicants is fit. Um, that's not just something they get to do. That's something that you also have to consider as well. How, a pro how well a program fits really with your interests and goals. So these are, um, the next two slides are basically just a kind of series of questions that you want to ask um, yourself and ask of the program when you're trying to make selections. Now, applying to graduate programs can be pretty daunting, especially depending on your field and what you study because there's so many programs. Um, even within the state of California, if you were applying to master's <laughs> programs and say, I don't know, clinical psychology, uh, you would have a number of programs um, to choose from. But within that, there can be a lot of, even within all those programs, even though they all might have the same name, there can be a lot of variation. So it's really important to think about, um, this is some, somewhere that's um, hopefully going to launch you and prepare you for your um, career or for further graduate study. Um, it's obviously going to be additional time that you're in school, so you want to obviously make sure it's a good, a good fit for what you're looking for. So the first question that's up here is um, to consider what is the profile of recently admitted students? Um, so this basically means asking, what, what is your typical enrolled student, so student enrolled in your program, look like? What is their GPA? What kind of experience do they have coming in? Um, if they require you to take a standardized test like the graduate record exam or GRE or MCAT for um, uh, medical school, um, what, what are the... What, what, what is this typical applicant, or I mean successful applicant, so currently current student, what are their, uh, what kind of scores do they have? What's their GPA? What do they come in at? That's going to give you a sense of really how, uh, who the program is looking for, what kind of, um, I guess, caliber of student, and also it will give you a sense of like how competitive the program is. And that gives you a benchmark of what you need to kind of shoot or aspire. Uh, for in your study. So, um, Dr. Marshall was right. Uh, you'll see I have a timeline here in a few slides about kind of when to start thinking this, but it's uh, about grad school and when to start researching schools. And the best recommendation is to think about schools that you're going to apply to, start looking for them the summer before. So say you guys were applying in the fall, which is typically when applications are due, you might want to start this summer. But actually, if you know for sure that's already something you want to do, it doesn't hurt to start now because some of these things you can't change. <laughs> you don't have as much time to change, or if you, like I said, if you need research experience, or um, you know, some of you know, if they require standardized tests like the GRE, you need ample time to prepare. So the more you know uh, what they're looking for and what, again, what kind of like the sort of benchmark is and what's considered a good score and what make what is considered a good applicant. Um, the sooner you can kind of work on that um, yourself. And so the more time you have, once you know that, the better, because that gives you additional time to prepare. Some programs will report this information uh, on their website, which is really nice. Um, uh, the students I mentor are lucky because those that are interested in going to clinical psych PhD programs, they're accredited by the American Psychological Association. And as part of that accreditation status, they have to put how many applications they receive, how many people they interview, how many accept, what their GRE scores are, what their GPA is, and so how long it takes them to complete the program, where they go afterwards. They have to track all this um, information about their students and kind of have it made public. So that's nice. And I think medical schools do the same thing um, as well. But if they don't have this information readily available on the website, it doesn't hurt to uh, reach out and talk to either the program director or faculty that are affiliated with that program and they should be able to provide you with this information. A lot of our graduate programs here on campus usually will have like information sessions sometimes in the fall, sometime in the fall where they'll share some of this information 
um, with prospective students. Also at conferences, usually they, some uh, programs will um, have representatives at conferences, and so that's another you know, opportunity for you to kind of find somebody that could answer some of these questions. Um, the next second uh, question here is related, and I've kind of already mentioned it, but um, what is the program's success rate in terms of how many students they admit that actually graduate, and what's the number, average number of years required to do so? So again, this is something that sometimes they'll just have it available on their website, but if not, you should ask. Um, why do you think it'd be good to know how many of students that are admitted graduate? <laughs> know your odds. <laughs> well, you might think like, who cares who graduates? Like, I'm me, I'm different, I'm going to be fine. But I think if you're, especially if you're moving across the country or if you're dedicating, you know, resources like money to go to graduate school, you know, you certainly want to know that there's going to be a good likelihood that you're going to be able to complete the program. And sometimes a sign of, um, you know, high admittance and low completion rates can be um, reflective not necessarily of the students, but also of the program. Like maybe there's limited support, or maybe it's very competitive, or maybe they have a very lenient um, admissions process, and then they kind of just haze people out. So it's going to give you a proxy for, I think, on average, like can most students be successful in that program? And you know, um, so it, it's good information to have. As for number of years, that also, you know, kind of can speak to a little bit about um, the support and mentoring available in the program, but also whether or not it's, it's, it's feasible um, for you to finish within a reasonable amount of time that, that fits with your kind of goals or expectations. So if these two bu bullet points that we've just talked about, if they're not on the website, again, those are good things to ask current students or faculty or program directors. Um, the next one is what are the goals and objectives of the program and do they match your interests and academic preparation as a prospective graduate student? So you really want to know like what is the kind of overarching goal of this program? What is it designed to prepare students for? What is its um, kind of mission? What are some of its values? Uh, and that can help you, know, you figure out again whether or not it's a good fit for you. Most of that kind of information is almost always available on the website. And it is something that, well, certainly you can reach out and ask questions when you're considering the program. You can ask questions to prospective students and faculty. I would recommend checking the website first, only because sometimes when students ask questions that are very basic and are very clear about the program, they can mistakenly make a bad impression by appearing like you know, they haven't done any of their homework, so to speak. So definitely familiarize yourself with the program and then figure out, you know, hopefully you get the basic questions answered and then you can ask more in-depth questions that kind of illustrate, you know, how awesome you are as well as how, how seriously you're considering um, said program. Um, okay, uh, for programs with an emphasis on academic and research careers, you want to know, um, so this is more for like doctoral level programs, but you want to know what do graduate uh, students do after they graduate? Um, are they able to obtain what we call like postdoctoral positions? So yeah, it's another way to avoid adulting for a couple years. Um, but usually that's when you get to do exactly what you want to study without any classes and typically get paid and you get to work with, uh, you know, somebody really famous and, um, that usually helps prepare people for academic positions. Not that it's required. So not that it's required. So you don't have to necessarily factor that into your plan. It kind of depends. Um, but um, you know, how successful are students getting those kinds of fellowships or academic appointments or applied research position outside a college or university setting? And so this bullet point here is written more for like, like I said, academic or research-oriented programs. But the main essence of the question is really like, what do students do after they graduate? So you want to know that what students do, at least a majority of them, 
or half of them, some kind of significant number of them, go on to do hopefully what you want to do and they're successful in getting placed in those kinds of settings. So whether that's a research setting, an applied setting, getting an internship, you know, um, becoming a teacher, whatever it is, working in the industry, you want to know, okay, do people actually like do this once they, you know, complete this program? Any questions? Okay. So other um, important considerations for fit um, is, this is also a similar um, point to what I was just talking about, but if the program requires some kind of internship or practicum, so think like med school, residency, again, clinical psych and clinical internship, um, you want to know what is their success rate for placing students in that particular um, kind of um, practicum or internship or residency. Usually, so for example, like in clinical psych, you have to complete an internship in order to graduate and get your PhD. And it, the process is very similar to how it works for um, med students, I mean, they also have to complete a certain number of hours and internships and they have to do a residency um, in order to finish. So, especially when it's something that you need to actually finish the degree, you want to make sure that, again, students are being successful in finding those kinds of required positions because that's going to have implications for how likely you are, um, you know, able to finish your program. Um, for programs that have an emphasis on professional practice, again, think like law school, med school. If there's some kind of licensure or credential status that's required um, after, you know, to actually go and work in the field, you want to know how many students are successful in kind of obtaining that license or credential status. So you, it's all in line with wanting to know, like, what happens uh, to your graduates? Where do they go work? What kind of play... Uh, settings do they find employment in? If they need additional training, are they successful in getting those placements? You know, if they have to take some kind of licensure exam or credential um, process, are they successful in that? Okay. Another thing that's important to think about when considering fit um, is, of course, what types of financial assistance does each program offer? So typically with master's programs, there's usually less support uh, financial support for students. Now again, that can vary. Even for example, I'll just speak to the, again, I'm sorry, I'll just speak to the psychology uh, program because that's what I know best about, but certainly you should visit grad studies because they'd have more information. But some of our students are able to, to work on campus, to get teaching positions. There also are certain grants and scholarships that are only available to psychology students that they can apply for. And it's not going to cover, you know, their whole tuition, but it, it, it can help. Um, now, usually as you kind of, um, you know, when you think about like doctoral programs, those typically tend to provide much more financial um, kind of assistance. Of course, they're more competitive to get into and it's obviously a bigger time commitment, but um, oftentimes uh, graduate programs like doctoral programs can provide um, financial assistance in the form of like tuition waivers so where you don't pay any tuition and then usually you get some kind of assistantship. Uh, which will provide you with some kind of stipend um, that you can actually somewhat live off of, uh, or mostly live off of, live creatively off of, there we go. <laughs> um, and so usually those assistantships um, can take the forms of either like teaching assistantships where you're teaching on campus, or research assistants, assistantships where you're doing research, usually um, with working with some kind of PI or faculty mentor. And then of course there's also fellowships as well that you can apply for and scholarships too. Um, so you wanna be familiar with that uh, because especially depending on the graduate program that you're applying to, and especially for some more professional graduate programs um, or programs from private institutions, those can be pretty costly. So. Um, and again, if you think about, you know, if you're thinking about a PhD or something that's going to take, you know, quite some time, not only are you going to be, you know, not necessarily working because graduate programs are pretty um, demanding time-wise, it makes it pretty difficult to work outside of um, 
graduate school, depending on the program. But that's also something you want to assess when considering fit. If you know you want to work or you just want to go to school in the evening or, um, you know, if you have a family or something like that, then you want to get a sense of do people in these programs work and when do they work and is it possible to even balance that? And that'll help you kind of plan um, for what you might need um, financially. Any questions? Okay. So the other thing I want to mention about FIT that's not on here is geography. Because I think that that's a tough one uh, for a number of students, especially those that are considering doctoral study uh, or, or any kind of advanced, you know, beyond masters. So I think like law school, med school, grad, uh, you know, doctoral um, programs, things like that. I think with master's programs, you have a little bit more kind of latitude in terms of geography, but not always, because ultimately you want to go to the program that's best going to meet your, your goals and interests, and, and if you're choosing a program that really relies heavily on you identifying a mentor and doing some kind of research or apprenticeship under that mentor, then you're going to want to go to the program that has the mentor that fits your interests. But I think especially when we're talking about doctoral type programs, um, geography is something that always comes up, at least with my students in that. And I think it's a California thing, because, but maybe not. Maybe I'm just saying that because I'm from California, because I struggle with that too. But nobody wants to leave. <laughs> nobody wants to leave the state. Nobody wants to leave home. Nobody wants to leave their family or friends or like established lives. And I think that that's something that you have to be prepared to, you know, seriously consider if you're thinking about doctoral study. Because one, if you're geographically restricted, it's going to significantly limit your chances of getting into a program. And also, it's going to make it hard for you to find programs that are, you know, a really good fit in terms of, like, interests and goals and financial support and things of, of that nature. So that's something you should be prepared for. Um, it's funny because uh, I was just at the student research competition and there was somebody that's considering graduate school and they, I think they were considering or they're, they may be in a position where they're considering uh, studying in Virginia and they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, it'll be fine. It'll be great. I will say the time that I left California was probably the best time of my life. Like, I'm very happy that I was able to come back and that's what I told this student. Like, you can always come back, but you can't always, like, you know, have those same opportunities afforded to you. There's always ways to get back if you're, you know, if you are interested in kind of staying here. Or maybe you'll decide at that point once you get out that it's way too hot and crowded here and <laughs> you never want to come back. Um, but you can always come back. But it's good to, I think, consider that possibility. And, uh, you know, I was telling this, this student, I was like, you know, when else in life are you going to get an opportunity to be paid to study what you love, to get a PhD, to move to a different part of the country, to meet new people, you know, uh, it's, it's a pretty good deal, even though it can be pretty scary. But my point is to think about it now and prepare yourself now um, for that possibility. Um, you know, at least like within clinical side, for example, there were some students that, are, like even when I was applying, some of my classmates, you know, uh, you know didn't want to leave the state and they ended up not, but then they also ended up going to programs, like more professional programs where they had to pay Twenty to thirty thousand dollars a year, whereas I got paid to get my PhD. So, and I went to a, a better program. But so be open to that possibility. I think you know. Again, you're already taking the plunge. Uh, so uh, why not consider uh, that as well? Any questions? No? Okay. So application components. Some of this we've already talked about. So I'm not going to go into too much depth about statement of purpose or anything like that, because we already have. But usually, while, when you're checking out programs, you also want to familiarize yourself with what, and what they actually need to have a complete application so that you can start kind of preparing for that. Um, so one thing is you want to be sure of like, what are the kind of um, application requirements or degree requirements? So for example, if you want to get a PhD in psychology, do they require you to have a bachelor's degree in psychology? And if they don't, then what kinds of prerequisite coursework do they require? A lot of times, you know, students may uh, major in something different for their undergraduate degree and then decide to um, apply 
in a different discipline, or maybe you're applying to some kind of professional program like med school or law school, you obviously need to be familiar with what the prerequisite courses are, and you want to know that ahead of time so that, especially when you're in your undergraduate, um, uh, when you're in your un in undergraduate institutions, that you can actually you know take those classes and not have to you know go back and kind of do it later. Although you may find yourself in a position where you have to do that, and that's okay. But yeah, clearly you want to know what you need um, to get in, what they're looking for in applicants. Um, usually they require official transcripts. I've heard this is something that's changing, at least from students that I work with, where now they actually are satisfied with unofficial transcripts uh, until you're actually admitted, which makes a lot of sense because it's kind of a pain, especially if you went to more than one institution which I guess most of you will hopefully just stay at one institution so that's not too complicated. But if you happen to be a transfer student or uh, maybe you were in school and then came back, you know, left and came back, it can be hard to kind of get transcripts from everywhere. And it's expensive and it's kind of a hassle and, uh, it's, it, you know. But anyway, you might need them and those you need to order ahead of time. Um, so you want to have a good sense of, of uh, who requires those and when they're needed. Um, sometimes um, certain programs may require you to take some kind of standardized exam like the graduate record exam, the GRE, or the GMAT for business, or the MCAT for med schools, LSAT for law school. Uh, whatever the test is, you want to know what that exam is, what students that are successful in the programs that you're interested in to, Score on that test, again, to kind of give you a goal or benchmark, and then you want to start preparing for it. I do not recommend, for example, for the GRE, or really for any of these, but I do not recommend going to the last minute um, to take them and taking them without any kind of preparation. Um, it's, you know, the outcome is probably going to be similar to what you can imagine when, if you didn't prepare at all for the SAT. But I think... Um, in my experience working with students, I think that that's kind of the most challenging part of the application process for them. Some students might have to take um, like the GRE more than once, and so um, hopefully that won't be the case for any of you. Um, but you want to allow yourself time to do that. OSR actually does offer free GRE course preparation over the summer. Um, keep an eye out or contact me. Um, we typically send a call out for students to sign up for that sometime in the winter um, and then that uh, gets offered over the summer, either online or in person. Uh, it's through Princeton Review, so it's a, it's a pretty um, legitimate <laughs> um, you know, training program or preparation program, but we do have limited spots. So I think we only accommodate about 30 students. And I think we already have about 30 on the wait list for this year, but I'm trying to see if we can get a second class. Um, but that is something that you know I, uh, we have offered historically every summer, and I'm hoping that'll continue. And so when you get to that point, reach out to me or Danielle White if you want to know more about when that sign-up process is. It's also on the website, of course, but I think it's something that most students kind of don't necessarily know about because some of these preparation um, courses can be pretty expensive. Um, okay, statement of purpose, talked about that. 99% uh, sure your application is going to require you to write some kind of statement of purpose for graduate school. Uh, letters of recommendation and then the interview. So I'm just going to talk for one second about letters of recommendation. I think I've mentioned it to you before in other presentations, um, but typically most applications will require three letters of recommendation. This is something that you definitely want to keep um, kind of in your mind now. Uh, even if you're considering applying to fellowship programs like Mellon Mays or scholarships, grants, things like that. Um, having good letters of recommendation is going to be really important. So thinking about now ways that you can, you know, form relationships with faculty that can write you strong letters of recommendation. And that's really the key, making sure that the letter is going to be strong. In some cases, you know, you might even want to ask the person, can you write me a strong letter of recommendation? 
And most, most faculty will report, you know, honestly whether they can or can't. In my own personal experience, most of the time where I haven't written a letter, I'll usually always write a letter if the student's completely um, desperate, but most of the context where I don't write letters is not because I dislike the student, it's usually because I don't know the student. So sometimes I'll get students that'll say like, like I just had one a couple uh, months ago, and the student was in an online class of mine, so that made it even harder because I don't know them at all. Uh, but sometimes, you know, you, you know, you'll teach a, cl a class of this size or of this many seats, and um, you'll, um, you know, if it's especially if it's a, a lecture-based class, so it's mostly lecture, you don't really get as much interaction one-on-one -on -one with students. So sometimes all I can say is like, yeah, you got an A, or yeah, you were second highest in the class, or whatever it is, but I can't really speak beyond that. And while grades are important, they are going to see your grades uh, reflected in your transcripts and, you know, in your GPA. So the point of the letter is to really, you know, do a good job of demonstrating kind of who you are, what kind of student you are, what kind of person you are, what you've done, what you've accomplished. So you really want to kind of foster those relationships early on. And the best way to start is by doing some kind of research or creative activity with a faculty member, but if not, Think, you know, you need a, three letters usually, you know, at least try to take courses from the same faculty member if, if that's an option. So if there's a faculty member you like or maybe you've gotten to know them just a little bit or, you know, continue to take classes with them because then it, it just gives them more observations to get to comment on you and get to know you. Um, meet with faculty, you know, during office hours, express to them kind of your goals and your interests. One of you'll hopefully walk away learning something that'll help you be successful in obtain, you know, attaining your goals, and two, that'll help them get to know you so that, you know, they'll have hopefully, you know, a little bit more to say about you if you ask them for a letter. But the key is, is that they need to be strong. Oftentimes, you know, for most kind of programs, you know, usually three will come from faculty members or two will come for faculty members and one will come from some kind of outside um, volunteer activity or um, if you are part of a club or organization or something like that. So uh, it's nice to have, I think, two academic and then one that is non-academic but obviously still fits with, you know, what the program is designed to kind of get you involved with, um, but you want to be thinking about that kind of early on and kind of fostering uh, those relationships. Okay, so here's the typical grad school application timeline. Um, I just want to, I guess, give a little disclaimer that the, the dates up here obviously can vary depending on field or program of, of study, uh, I mean program or field of study. So. Again, this is really why you want to start exploring programs early, if for nothing else, just to know like when you typically need to apply. So, like I was saying, in the summer before you intend to apply, that's when you, at the latest, want to start researching potential schools and start compiling a list. Um, usually for doctoral programs, students will apply from anywhere from like 5 to 15 programs, um, depending on how competitive the program is and how specific, you know, what, what you want to study, um, you know, like how many, you know, programs that are a good match that uh, are available. Um, but you usually want to apply, you know, I usually encourage my students if you're applying for a master's to apply for three to five, to three to five programs, and if they're applying for PhD programs to do somewhere between like five and 15, which is pretty broad, but it kind of depends on, again, uh, their interests. The better fit you are, I think the less programs you actually need to apply for. Um, but again, it also depends on how competitive um, the programs are. Then in the summer before you apply, uh, you want to take, uh, begin preparing for any kind of standardized exam that you have to take, like the GRE exam. Oftentimes if you're applying to a research-based program, whether it's master's or PhD, um, if it's a program that operates, and again, this is information you can get by reaching out and asking or looking on their website. If they have more of a mentorship model, which most like PhD programs do, for example, 
you want to re um, reach out to potential mentors early and usually that's in the summer and so usually you can just email them and ask them like hey are you in, in, in a less casual way yeah. but you want to ask them if they're planning to accept students in the fall sometimes they'll have that on their faculty website um, but if they don't then you it's a good opportunity for you to reach out and ask um, and you can always find out you know what kind of what their current projects are or something of that sort if you know you want to kind of get a chance to talk to them and see what they have in the pipeline and what you know uh, what they're currently doing or what their students are currently doing but it's a good uh, opportunity to reach out I think also if you attend like conferences that are attended by potential mentors that's also something you could ask them but sometimes it's I think a little more challenging for a number of reasons to track people down in person um, but you can certainly email, they're used to getting those emails, or make sure that you check their website. Um, then sometime late in the summer, after you've spent the summer kind of preparing, you want to take the graduate record exam. And again, these dates might shift a little, um, depending on which standardized exam you have to take. Um, also, another thing to keep in mind is that some programs might require like a GRE subject test. So there's the graduate record exam, it's similar to the SAT, um, but then there's also um, other graduate record exams that focus just on specific fields. So for example, there's a psychology subject test. Um, so if that's something that your program requires, you want to make sure that you allow time to study for that and time to take it. Usually if there's a subject test required, um, those aren't, like the GRE you can take pretty much whenever you want. Like you can, you sign up, you go to a testing center. Also you want to budget that in as well because that's expensive. Um, but I think it's about $400 to take the GRE or maybe it's two. It's, it's, it's definitely at least two something. But I feel like it might be a little, maybe force too much. I'll have to look it up. But you want to kind of factor that in as well. Um, but subject tests usually are not offered like as regularly as the, the actual GRE, because you usually take those on a specific day, a specific place, depending on where you're located. So those you might want to make sure that you plan, give a little bit more um, consideration to your planning. Um, in October, that's when you want to start requesting official transcripts and letters of recommendation. Uh, going back to letters of recommendation, you want to ask your letter writers as early as possible. Um, Oftentimes, faculty are writing letters for a number of students. Um, I probably write during one cycle 15 to 20 letters for students. And so you want to make sure that you know, you're giving them a, you know, a sufficient amount of time. Um, especially you know, if it's a faculty member that you, um, you know, have worked pretty in depth with, you, know, you want them to write a good letter. Like when I write a letter for one of my students that has done a master's with me or an undergraduate thesis with me, you know, usually their letters are anywhere from like two to three pages. So something like that, a really thoughtful, detailed letter, you know, does require, um, you know, a decent amount of time. So ask as early as you can. Uh, and then usually what I recommend that my students do is when they do ask me for letters, they can kind of casually ask me, but when they kind of formally ask me, I ask them to kind of create a like an Excel spreadsheet or table that kind of lists the name of the pro, like the name of the school, the particular program. So if there's different programs you're applying for, um, I know how to describe the program when I'm talking about your interest in it in my letter. Um, to tell me when it's due and how I should submit it and whether or not there's some kind of form I need to fill out. All of that stuff you need to think about, and that's why it's good to familiarize yourself with the program's you know, application requirements ahead of time. I can't tell you how many students have been like, I've been like, well, where's the form? And they've been like, what form? And like, I'm telling them there's a form for the program like they're applying for, right? Um, or um, they're emailing me the form last minute, and then I've got like six different emails from this person I have to pull up. Send it all in one email, it makes it easiest. One spreadsheet with what you, where you need your letters sent to, and when and how, and then usually your statement or CV is what you should also include at a minimum. Some people like a writing sample. I mean, if, they, if the letter writer knows you're writing, they might not need it. But 
Um, ask well in advance and ask in a thoughtful way and send your materials in a thoughtful way. It makes it, because again, most faculty are writing more than letters from more than one student. And um, also, things can easily get lost or missed. Like, I mean, I've had students be like, I'm applying to these three programs. And then they send like another email like a week later. Oh, and this one. Oh, and this one. That's a really easy way. I've never missed a letter, let me say. I've never not submitted a letter for somebody. But it's an easy way to get uh, for error to kind of come into um, to the equation here. If, if, you know, it's all, the information is all scattered across the place and I have to dig through all of my emails to find out exactly where you're applying to or where I need to send a letter. Okay. Um, then you also want to start working on your personal statement. Um, November is a good time to kind of have your personal statement, kind of at least a draft of it. You might be continuing to get feedback, but you want to have at least a good solid draft. For most doctoral programs, applications are typically due in December or January. Um, so that's something good to have on your radar. But again, you really want to check depending on your field and what you're interested in. Um, and then master's programs are usually a little bit later, so those are more like February, March. But again, you want to make sure that that's the case for, you know, whatever kind of program you, or discipline you're applying uh, for. Then usually February, March, that's kind of the waiting game where you kind of sit anxiously and constantly refresh your phone to see if you're getting any emails. Uh, make sure you clear your phone because sometimes places will call you to, you know, let you know that you have received an interview. So you want to make sure you have good space on your voicemail. Um, also, make sure if you put your phone number on an application or if it's on your resume or CV, make sure it's like your real phone number. Like not, I don't know, nobody really has like house numbers these days, but make sure your phone number is current and that it's a number that you're actually going to answer. And make sure that when you put an email address, it's one that you actually check. Even just as recently as this cycle in our graduate application process here, there's students that like we could not get a hold of to be like, you've got an interview. And we're trying to schedule these interviews in a short amount of time, but then we can't get a hold of them because their voicemail is full and their email, they're not checking their email. And so you want to make sure that you're, you know, that you're actively Checking these kinds of um, media and that you give correct information. Yeah. Do you have a question? Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, and okay, so in terms of interviews, um, some graduate programs won't have interviews at all. They'll just tell you that you've gotten in or that you didn't. <laughs> um, some graduate programs will have you do phone interviews. Some graduate programs will have you do on-campus interviews. That's usually, the on-campus interviews are usually, um, you know, more specific to, well, I guess more master's and, uh, grad, uh, you know, PhD level programs. Um, so I guess it can actually be with both. Um, my recommendation is if you have an on-campus interview, go. Um, you know, one, it suggests strong interest in the program if you actually go to the interview versus phone. Sometimes it's not feasible because maybe you have some kind of conflict time-wise, or maybe you can't afford um, to travel to the interview, but I would make your best effort to actually go in person. Um, I don't have data, but I'm sure there's data out there that you could find that would kind of indicate whether or not people are more successful on phone or in person, but I think it's, personally, it's easier to get to know somebody if you actually get to meet them versus on the phone. So I think you increase your chances by going. And remember back to the whole beginning of this presentation, it's all about fit. So if you really want to get a sense of the program and the students and what it's like and where you're going to live and whether or not you like the people or whether or not you like this mentor, you're not going to really be able to gauge that through you know, a 30 minute to one hour phone interview, right? You really need to go there and kind of check it out for yourself. And especially if you're talking about something like med school or law school or a PhD program where you're going to be spending a significant amount of time, you know, that's a long time to be unhappy or to be in a place where you don't like the people, you know, I mean, there's only certain things you have control over, right? Because sometimes you get in where you get in. But, you know, you, you're going to have more information if you actually go in person. So 
Uh, I recommend if you have the opportunity to go on campus for an interview, that you make every effort um, to go, even if it's your backup or safety. Your backup or safety should never know that they're your backup or your that, you're, that they're your backup or safety. Otherwise, they're not really a backup or safety because they're not going to admit you. So you have to treat every school like it's your first choice because you just never know. Um, okay, and then typically you get information about admissions sometime in the spring, like March or April. <clears throat> okay, so I think that's pretty much, well, the only other thing I want to mention about interviews um, that I didn't mention on, on, uh, that's on this slide is that uh, before you go to an interview, especially if it's like, you know, for doctoral programs, Sometimes the interviews are like a day long or even over the course of a weekend. And so um, you might be meeting with more uh, individuals than just like one faculty member. So usually they'll give you some information about the interview, but you kind of want to know like who you're going to be meeting with. And you kind of want to be prepared for those meetings. So for example, for clinical like psychology doctoral programs, those are usually um, over the course of one to two days. You usually interview with students, you interview with three to five faculty. There's usually a, some kind of party or reception with graduate students, and there's usually some kind of dinner with faculty. So you want to be prepared for all these events, think about what you're going to wear, uh, and also think about questions that you want to ask. You'll get tired of asking questions, especially in these contexts where the interviews are longer. If it's like a 30 minute interview with one person or a panel, you always want to go prepared with questions regardless of the type of interview, but especially if it's an interview that's like all day or over the course of a couple days, it's you're going to find quickly you're going to kind of run out of questions, and then sometimes you will come back and be like, oh, why didn't I ask that? So you really want to think ahead of time um, about what you want to ask of students. But remember, check the website and don't ask anything that's like too basic because otherwise it might just appear like, again, you haven't done your homework or, or you're not interested uh, in the program. Um, usually people will bring like their resume or CV to an interview. Uh, I don't think it's something that people routinely ask for because usually they have your application. But you never know, so it's kind of a, a good thing to, to bring just in case. Um, so review the website. Also review your application. Most of what they're going to ask you is probably included somewhere in your application or in your personal statement. So. Um, you know, if you're just getting really anxious or nervous, that's a good place to, to kind of like ground yourself and be like, okay, yes, this is what I, this is why I want to do this. And these are the, these are the, you know, um, kind of well-developed answers I came up with to kind of describe why. Um, also, if it's a mentor-based program, so you're essentially applying to work with a particular individual, um, you want to be familiar with your mentor's work. That doesn't mean you need to read everything that they've ever published or know everything that they've ever done. Um, but it helps to have at least some familiarity um, with you know, their research. Um, they're not going to quiz you on it. But again, it shows you know, that you're interested and that you have um, you know, taken appropriate consideration into this process. Okay. I think that's all I've got. Are there any questions? It's a lot of information. Um, so I think the key is, depending on where you're at right now, mostly what you just want to think about is, do I want to go to graduate school and what kinds of programs would I be interested in? That's probably an appropriate place to start. But I will say that time goes by quickly. Um, this year has probably gone quickly uh, for, for you all. Um, it seems to go by faster and faster. Even graduate school, I feel like goes by incredibly fast compared to like undergraduate. So it goes by fast. So you want to have this stuff on your radar and start thinking about it. And the best place to start, if you're not sure, or you don't even know where to start, ask a faculty member. You know, that's what we're here for. Or ask, you know, graduate students, you know, if, if there's a graduate program in your department. Um, you know, that's a good way to really get kind of, to learn from other people's experience, to get advice, to help people help point you in the right direction. Um, and feel free to reach out if you have 
any questions. Um, and also reach out to our Graduate Studies Office. They are a great uh, resource as well. Um, they're starting to have a number of different events on campus and fairs. And I think they have Grad, grad Week is in the fall, where it's just kind of like our research week, but it's all about grad school. So keep an eye out for that in the fall. Um, and there will be a good opportunity for you to get information about programs here, but also just how to best prepare for applying to programs broadly. All right, that's all I've got. So. All right. Very early. Right. so, by the time we get to the end of the year, Dr. Hazia will have spent 20% of colloquiums with us. Wow. Yeah. So we figure we're going to make her an honorary member of the, of the honors program. So we've got a water bottle. So exciting. We've got a polo shirt. Wow, all this. And we've got a t-shirt. So help me one more time. Thank you. All right. it's, it's been great, like, uh, you know, getting to come here and talk to you all and looking forward to, again, hoping to do it again in the future. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at any point. All right. Thank you. On the sign-in sheet for the thing that comes around, it says May 1st. It does? Yeah. Instead of May 10th?